be early celebrations for Kendall. Slaven Bilic's header, though, was ruled out for offside. And linesman, or assistant refs, if you will, do get it right sometimes, you know. Graham Stewart, the man who'd strayed. Lombardo made an immediate impact, combining with Roger and then Warhurst to give Palace the lead. And he was onside. Check out the Everton legs at the top of the screen, playing him on. A debut goal for the unmistakable Italian. And Lombardo played a part in Palace's second goal. No complaints here from Graham Stewart. Stewart reckless with his challenge. Bruce Dyer cool and collected from the spot. Duncan Ferguson gave Everton hope as he powered home Graham Stewart's cross. Everton need the giant striker to stay fit after signing a new contract. He's vital to their season. Everton won, Palace two. Gilly celebrating their top flight return with a goal. Nathan Blake feeding Alan Thompson. Last season's top scorer, John McGinley, agonisingly close. Colin Todd's men look much better prepared for the Premiership this time around, but they probably didn't think it would be this easy. If you thought Scott Sellers had space here, look at Nathan Blake here. Blake carrying on from where he and McGinley left off last season. Southampton looked for a flag, which rightly didn't come. Blake with a point to prove in the Premier, but it won't usually be this much of a stroll. One bright spot for Southampton, keeper Paul Jones, who Dave Jones brought with him from Stockport, had a sensational debut, denying Alan Thompson, amongst others. Southampton nil, Bolton one. Saw a capacity crowd at Highfield Road, and Chelsea were definitely the better side in the opening period. Dan Petrescu with one of a number of chances created by Rude Hullet's side. Many fans in the large crowd must have been looking forward to a cool drink at half-time when Chelsea at last converted their superiority into a goal, and it took a defender to show the forwards the way into the net, Frank Sinclair putting Chelsea ahead. Zalarko and Burrows were completely deceived by Sinclair's striding run forward, and with Coventry hardly able to mount an attack, Chelsea must have been confident of going on to record a victory. But moments later, Gordon Strachan's side had pulled level. Dion Dublin, the scorer, though he was given plenty of room by the Chelsea defence. Ed De Hoy making his debut in the Chelsea goal had hardly touched the ball all match. He didn't get anywhere near to Dublin's header. Although Chelsea still created plenty of chances, it took the introduction of Norwegian substitute Tor Andre Flo to see those opportunities turned into another goal. Flo had only been on the pitch for five minutes before he put Chelsea back in front. And with Chelsea easily looking the better side, it seemed as though Flo would be acclaimed as Chelsea's match winner. That it wasn't to be was due to a combination of two factors, the determination of Dion Dublin and the generosity of Chelsea's defence. Dublin, Coventry's top scorer last season, pulled the Sky Blues level for a second time with a second header. Again, the Chelsea defence forced to hang their heads in shame, but Dublin had three Chelsea players around him when scoring. The excitement wasn't yet over. Chelsea should have taken the lead for a third time, but Flo missed a wonderful opportunity. Chelsea were made to pay. Frank LeBeuf failed to clear in the final moments, and Dublin drove home the winner as the referee ignored Chelsea's appeals for offside. Despite their undoubted class, Chelsea need to toughen up if they're to make a challenge for the title. This defeat may in the long run turn out to do Chelsea a favour. For Coventry, three valuable points. An opening day hat-trick for Dion Dublin, an opening day headache for Ruud Hallett. Coventry three. Arsene Wenger has spent near on £50 million ringing the changes at Arsenal, but some things, some people, never change. Nervous moments for the Premiership's most expensive summer signing, Mark Overmars, before kick-off. 
still an Arsenal player, David Platt had to be content with the place on the bench. As temperatures soared at Ellen Road, the pre-match entertainment didn't help cool things down. There were no look-alikes in the two teams with very different ambitions. Leeds will be happy with a top six finish to qualify for Europe, as the very least Arsenal want to, need to achieve. Overmars immediately showed his pace down the left flank, but Radivi got the measure of him here. A minute later, on the other side, Ray Parler forced his way into a great goal-scoring position, but his finish didn't match his determination. Once they settled, Leeds fought back. Rob Wallace's glancing header from Kelly's cross gave the home fans something to shout about on 30 minutes. And they were even more impressed with Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank's effort that brought the best out of David Seaman. George Gray must have been impressed, but he wasn't showing it. There was real concern for his opposite number, but it didn't last long. Leeds gave away possession only to see you-know-who make them pay dearly. Ever closer to Cliff Baston's goal-scoring record, Ian Wright, looking to further impress a shearless England manager, was off and running for the new campaign. This could be quite some year for Ian Wright. It was George Graham who instilled the never-say-die spirit at Highbury. He looks to have done the same at Ellen Road. Seven minutes later, the man with just Jimmy on the back of his shirt equalised with a finish Wright would have been proud of. Graham actually likens him to Ian Wright. Maybe he's discovered another goal-scoring gem. Whatever, he's already a cult figure in Yorkshire. David Platt got his big chance just after the hour to replace the injured Patrick Vieira. His last Arsenal run-out if Brian Robson has anything to do with it. Three minutes later, Arsenal went double Dutch. Burkamp setting up his fellow countryman Overmars, but a dream debut in English football was ruined by the reflexes of Nigel Martin, another player who's keen to impress Glenn Hoddle further. So, a point of peace for two managers, both looking to stamp further authority but with different end-of-season targets. And Milosevic, and all was well for half an hour. Mark Draper found £7 million Stan the man. His cross was assisted by Matt Elliott, Draper close to ending a personal goal drought against his old club. The fast emerging talents of Emil Heskey caused Villa problems aplenty, and when he found wing-back Steve Guppy, he kind of knew what was coming next. The perfect cross, and the perfect header from Ian Marshall. Guppy getting the better of Portuguese international Fernando Nelson. Marshall splattering Alan Wright. Pick that one out. Martin O'Neill vindicated in deferring the journeyman striker to Steve Parridge in his starting lineup. Leicester 1, Villa 0. Well, Stuart Ripley looking to rebuild his career, finding Chris Sutton looking to rebuild his. At 5 foot 8, Kevin Gallagher's not normally a threat in the air. Maybe that's why Derby left him alone. Derby began with no recognised strikers. It was hard to recognise their defenders here. Substitute Ashley Ward, a target for Birmingham, was denied by Hodgson's £3 million Swiss signing Stefan Henschoss. Blackburn won, Derby nil.